Welcome to Trinity. My name is Bex, and this past week marked a significant day for our country. On Wednesday, we celebrated Remembrance Day. With the restrictions and limitations that all of us have gone through in this season of COVID, it's heightened our awareness of what freedom actually looks like. As Canadians, we have inherited a peace and freedom that was fought and died for. As Christ followers, there is spiritual freedom that we have inherited because of the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what we remember, what we celebrate when we gather, and what moves us to live lives that are a sacrifice of love for others. Galatians chapter 5 says it best this way. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Throughout our service today, we'll be reminded of what freedom looks like. In the lyrics of the songs, the story of Joseph that Sarah's going to unpack in the next chapter of the story, today. Let's be reminded that because of the great freedom we have, let us live out the mission of our church to love God, love others, and change the world through Christ. Creation cry, God. 
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body, it began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Oh, your buried body, it began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Yes, Jesus, yours, it's the Earlier this week, over some homemade soup for supper, my family got to talking about our days. It was then my daughter Caden shared, I just wish my teacher would ask me a boring question like what I had for lunch instead of something about COVID. It was almost nostalgic and it hit home. It's been a long week, well, a long year, hasn't it? You kind of want to take a time machine to wherever you don't have to hear the words unprecedented or new normal or spacing ever again. I know I do. And yet, if we're looking way back in the past or too far into the future, we just might miss something. What God has for us today, like his promise of hope that is always alive and well. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ my living hope. And every single day, Jesus offers that hope to me and to you. It brings life to our souls. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we sing those words and sometimes they fall off our lips, but they don't dig into our hearts. I pray today that by your spirit, we would understand fresh what it means to have a living hope. A living hope that never leaves us. A living hope that's always with us no matter what we're enduring in our everyday life. And a living hope that invades our hearts and souls and gives us joy and peace no matter the circumstance. So, Jesus, we so thank you for what you did on the cross and thank you that you offer that hope to us today. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. Hey, I'm pretty sure on the other side of this camera, you have a membership somewhere, Costco, Amazon Prime, or you wish you had a BCAA membership when your car doesn't start in this weather. I learned that lesson a number of years ago. Now, all those memberships offer perks and protection, but they can't offer what being a member at Trinity can. A like-minded community of Christ followers passionate about speaking into the vision, purpose, direction, and practices unique to Trinity Church. And maybe, just maybe you didn't even know this, discounts on the cinnamon buns and higher grounds. Okay. 
That's not true. But I caught your attention, didn't I? <laughs> uh, membership affirms your active participation and contribution to advancing God's purposes through our church together. So if you want to become a member today, head to our website or app and start the membership process through the links. And then you, along with all the members of our church, can join us on December 1st for our annual general meeting virtual style. So stay tuned in the coming weeks for all the registration details and documents. Now, usually at this point in the service, we encourage all the kids to launch into our very own Trinity Kid Experience for a message right-sized just for them. Now, have you ever wondered why we do that? That's a fantastic question. For those of you with kids in grade school, COVID has given us a unique opportunity to experience music and times of worship together as a family. It's been a powerful experience for me, and I'm certain for you too. Then when we get to the message part of the service, we know that kids learn and process information way different than adults. And we've always valued age-appropriate learning. And I'll be honest, sometimes the kid's style makes way more sense to me too. So that's why we have an incredible team of volunteers and staff that make up Trinity Kids, middle school and high school experiences. And if you were watching last week, they also helped Dave with his art piece, if you could call it an art piece. But you know what? Instead of me telling you about it, let's go check it out because the Trinity Kids team is recording this week's segment for your family right now. This is it. This is where all Trinity Kids is filmed, middle school and next gen. I'm so excited to go meet a couple people. Hello, fine sir. What's your name? Hi, I'm Mark. Mark, pleasure to meet you. And what do you do, Mark? A lot to do with the sound and uh, the microphones. I've been part of the tech team for almost two years now. Awesome. And we used to do that in the kind of the other side. Back in the auditorium. <laughs> cool. It's so cool that you're taking your skill set from the auditorium, using them to help us here serve kids on the weekend. It is a lot of fun. Hey, I'm Scott. Who are you? Zoe. Zoe. How long have you been doing this, Zoe? Seven years now. Seven years. And what have you done on the tech team? Everything from making sure everyone's in the right spot on the stage to helping with the cameras. Okay, okay. now we've got the hooligans over here. June, <laughs> Susie, Brady. So you did what? I did preschool filming to be. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah. And Thank Susie you. and Brady, what are you doing? We're what? getting ready. <laughs> yeah, We're getting apparently you're doing some elf stuff. Yeah. Who are you filming for? We're filming for our grade school kids, our mm -hmm. K to grade five. Okay, stop, 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 stop. I, I, I definitely, what? like, there's like a hole in the front. I, I ate all of it already. What? Brady, there's no bread left in there. Tracy, I know you. I know you too. That's right, you volunteer, but you also work at Trinity too, I right? Do. That's I do. That's cool. How long have you been volunteering? It's, I think four years at least. And what do you do? I do the graphics and I also do teleprompting now. Somebody gets in front of the camera and then you help them see a do little bit script. of hints and yeah, some script. Exactly. That, that is so ball. cool. Yeah. And who are you? Hi. My name is Harold. I'm the video switcher operating this console here, getting to choose whichever shots you get to see on TV. And have you done this for uh, auditorium normally or for Trinity Kids? I've done it for auditorium and uh, Trinity Kids is new for me. We're so glad that you're helping out today. Oh, it's a pleasure. I love it. I today am directing this whole shenanigans. Communicate with the talent, their artistic vision and get that to the switcher who's in the other room so he can direct the cameras and make it all happen. It's It's been a shift for me and for everyone figuring out what it looks like to be a part of the new reality. And and today this is it. Well, thanks for making us all better today. That's really cool. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, thanks for being here. Joel, thank you. Man, I could not be more humbled to be part of our Next Gen team. And honestly, I don't have words to express how grateful I am for each volunteer who serves our kids and our students, and for each family that we have the privilege of journeying with, especially in a season like this. Well, last weekend, we took a pause between chapters of our story series for some intentional prayer and worship and to celebrate baptisms. It was an amazing celebration of God at work in and through our community. I love those moments. Well, this week, we're diving into the next part of the story. 
It's week five of journeying through the larger narrative of scripture, and we're starting into chapter three. So if you're just joining us, there's still tons of time to jump in and catch up. You can catch up on earlier messages on the website, Trinity's app on YouTube, and you can pick up a hard copy of the book through our website or digitally on Kindle or Amazon. So since we took a week off, we're going to do a really quick recap before we get into the next section. You ready? <laughs> In chapter one, Wayne unpacked creation, Adam and Eve, and the fracture of humanity's story as we chose our own way to Noah and the flood and the way he found favor as he walked with God. In chapter two, Scott led us through the journey of Abraham and Sarah, an unlikely elderly couple with no kids through whom all nations would be blessed. Now, that seemed to almost come to a halt when God tested Abraham, having him place their son Isaac on an altar. But God, he intervened and provided an animal sacrifice, and Isaac would go on to be the father of two sons named Jacob and Esau. We discovered in their story that in every situation, God can be trusted. Okay, so that's a lot for two chapters, but where we left off, Jacob had reconciled with his brother and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, promising that a nation, the Israelites, would come from him. Now, it's important for context to fill in between where we left off and where we're picking up. So Jacob went on to have 12 sons, and these 12 sons would form the 12 tribes of Israel, one of whom, Judah, would become an ancestor in the genealogy of Jesus himself. You can find the full genealogy and how all of those dots connect between Jacob and Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 at the very start of the New Testament. Well, one of Jacob's sons, Joseph, was without a doubt his favorite, and it was obvious to everybody else. <laughs> Joseph was the first son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. He had one younger and 10 older brothers. And as the favorite son, Joseph is given a fancy coat from his father. Not a great move on Jacob's part, to be honest. See, this was totally against the grain of culture. If anything, a gesture like this, it should have been reserved for the eldest son. Definitely not the 11th son. This fancy coat, it was a beautiful robe made of many colors. The same one that made prime appearances in the 1968 musical and 1999 film, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. But seriously, in those days, it communicated clearly to Joseph's brothers that their father loved him the most. And that, that caused jealousy and bitterness to rise up among them. Now the coat, not Joseph's fault. But to make things worse, he did have a couple of dreams about his brothers and even his father bowing down to him, and he felt the need to tell them all about it. <laughs> Probably not the best way to win them over. In fact, Genesis 37.5 says when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. So while that dream did become significant later, which we'll discover in the second part of Joseph's story next week, it didn't leave things in a great place between Joseph and his brothers as we pick up in chapter three of the story on page 29. What I love about the story is that as we unpack each new chapter, each story helps us both discover God's big story in the larger narrative of scripture, and they're intended to help us live better today as we figure out what it means to follow Jesus here in Kelowna, or wherever you're watching in 2020. We're gonna look at three scenes of Joseph's story and there's some through lines that we'll begin to discover in each. And so as we do, a couple of encouragements. If you have a hard copy of the story with you, don't be afraid to mark it up. Write in it, highlight phrases that stand out or write questions that come to mind. You'll discover that there are a lot of moving pieces to Joseph's story. So if you've got a notebook or a piece of paper nearby, write down key events, or even draw it out as we work our way through. I did, and while my sketch is hilariously awful, it helps me track with the different pieces of Joseph's life. At the beginning of our chapter, Jacob, his father, sends Joseph to check on his brothers who are grazing their flocks. Bottom of page 29. 
So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. The brothers, they aren't thrilled to see Joseph arrive, and they come up with a plot to kill him. Now, one brother, Reuben, he pipes up and he suggests they throw him in a cistern instead of outright killing him. He'd die eventually. See, this was a stall tactic. His plan was actually to go back and rescue Joseph later. And so when Joseph shows up, they strip him of his robe. Yeah, this one. And they throw him in the cistern and leave him for dead and then sit down for lunch. And you think you don't always get along with your siblings. And as they're eating, a caravan of Midianite merchants go by, and the brothers have a brilliant idea. They decide to sell Joseph to them as a slave. It still gets rid of him, and they make some cash. Win-win. They even sell him for 20 shekels of silver, when most slaves would have sold for 30. And when they return home with Joseph's coat, they dip it in blood and show it to their father Jacob. And believing his son has been killed by a wild animal, he goes into mourning over the death of his favored son. Well, page 31. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Now, pause for a moment. It's been a rough go for Joseph. He's sold into slavery by his own brothers and ends up in a completely foreign city, sold to the captain of the Pharaoh's guard. And he lost his super fancy coat. Yet, there are glimpses in the background of God at work. So you might not be in the same situation as Joseph, but maybe it's been a rough go for you too lately. And you need to be reminded that God's still at work in your story too. Joseph's brother Reuben, he stopped the others from killing him. His life would have ended right then. That cistern that they threw him in, it was empty. Otherwise, he would have drowned. The caravan that he was sold to, it was heading to Egypt. Remember the promise that God made to Abraham? That his descendants would be like the stars? Well, with a great famine coming, which we'll learn more about soon, God's making an early move by sending Joseph to Egypt. And then he was placed strategically in a home of influence and opportunity. It's God's upper story breaking in. Page 31, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Potiphar put him in charge of his household, entrusted to his care everything he owned. Don't miss that phrase. The Lord was with Joseph. We'll see it come up throughout the chapter, and I'd encourage you to highlight it or circle it every time you see it. And similarly, when his master saw that the Lord was with him. Now, we don't get all the details, but I love imagining how that unfolded. There must have been something about Joseph's relationship with Potiphar that opened his master's eyes to the God he served. This was more than Potiphar just thinking, huh, Joseph's a good guy. This was Potiphar discovering that Joseph was trustworthy because his God was with him. Throughout Joseph's story, we'll be reminded of those two things over and over. The Lord was with him and others were watching and noticing. So if you're mapping his story out, it might look something like this. It got rough there for a while, but things are looking up. He arrived in Egypt as a slave, and now he's been trusted and put in charge of Potiphar's household. That's a big deal. Now, the bottom of page 31. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Repeatedly, she tried to get him to sleep with her. And repeatedly, Joseph refused. What we see play out, Joseph's integrity. He never gives in and makes it abundantly clear to her that that's a line he isn't willing to cross. Joseph was clear on the values that he lived by. Respect for others as he expresses towards his master Potiphar and ultimately to God. 
How could I then do such a wicked thing and sin against God, he says to her. Maybe that's a question to jot in the margin or as you map out Joseph's story. What values am I living by? What truth am I standing on? And if you struggle to answer that one, take some time this week to sit with it. Perhaps you help people wrestle with their values so that they'll live well, but candidly, you aren't clear on your values. You haven't taken the time to wisely and prayerfully work this out. And trust me, by the time you find yourself in a situation like Joseph's, it's too late. So maybe this week, that's the place to pause and do some work. What values am I living by? What truth am I standing on? But despite Joseph's firm refusals, one day when no one else is around, she tries again to get him to sleep with her. And Joseph literally runs the opposite direction. But as he does, Potiphar's wife manages to snag his cloak and keeps a firm grip on it. Joseph escapes, but she has his coat. When Potiphar comes home, she tells him that his Hebrew slave Joseph had attacked and tried to sleep with her, and she seemingly has his coat to prove it. Now remember, Potiphar is the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. He's a big deal and probably a scary guy. Awesome when you're on his good side, but terrifying when you're not. And Potiphar, believing his wife and seeing Joseph's coat in her hand, immediately throws Joseph in prison. So here we go. Second coat, gone. Now this, this is unfair. So far as we've read through the story, we've seen broken humans just like us making poor choices, like Adam and Eve in the garden, Abraham and Sarah not trusting God to keep his promises and trying to make them happen on their own, Jacob and the ways that he deceived and tricked his father and brother. But Joseph? Now, he's not perfect. He could have used a bit of self-control and brains when he decided to tell his brothers about that dream. But in this case, Joseph is innocent. Do you remember the book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day? Joseph's experiencing the extended version. Joseph and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad few years. (laughs) He's sold into slavery by his own brothers. He's taken to a foreign city. He ends up working in the home of the captain of the guard. And now he's thrown in prison for a crime he didn't even commit. In some ways, that can be like 2020 has felt, can't it? That trip or vacation that you'd been planning was canceled. What was initially a two-week lockdown has extended months with no clear end in sight. School and work feel upside down. Elderly parents or grandparents are isolated. You or someone you love is sick and alone in hospital or family. They're at a distance and you're not sure when you'll be able to be together again. But don't miss this. About halfway down page 32. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And so the warden put Joseph in charge of all of those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. See, even in prison, the Lord was with Joseph. And even in prison, the prison warden noticed. So be reminded, the Lord is with you even in 2020 in whatever situation and circumstances you're facing right now. And how you choose to live in the midst of it has the potential to be inspiring and compelling to others who are watching. Joseph's situation was looking pretty dire at this point. As a slave and then as a prisoner, it would have been easy for him to see his circumstances as hopeless. But instead, Joseph made a choice to do his best with each small task given to him. And his diligence and positive attitude were noticed by the warden. A line or two down, it says, The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph. 
No matter his circumstances, Joseph chose to continually and consistently do the next right thing. Maybe in this season, looking ahead at the big picture or the future can feel daunting. But what if this week, each day, (laughs) at work, at home, or at school, you follow Joseph's example by taking each small task and simply doing your best? That's a question I remember hearing years ago that stuck with me, and it's one that's worth jotting down and asking often. What's the next right thing that I can do today? In my life these days, it can feel like there's a lot that I'm not in control of, but what can I do? How can I adjust my attitude? How can I put others first? How can I focus on what is good and do what is right in this moment? Now, as Joseph was in prison, He also cultivated another talent. God gifted him with this unusual ability to discern the meaning of dreams. And in scripture, he interprets the dreams of two fellow inmates, Pharaoh's baker and Pharaoh's chief cupbearer. Again, something I always wonder is how they ended up in prison. Like, how does a baker end up in prison? (laughs) Scripture literally says the chief cupbearer and the chief baker offended their royal master, and he was angry, so he threw them both in prison. I mean, seriously, did he really mess up the cinnamon buns? Forget to make gluten-free bread? Was Pharaoh really passionate about sourdough? Who knows? But long story short, just as Joseph interpreted through their dreams, the baker is killed, but the cupbearer is restored to his position in the palace. However, he completely forgets to put in a good word to the Pharaoh about Joseph. Now, there's a lot more to that story, which you can read about in Genesis chapter 40, but essentially, Joseph remained stuck in prison for another two years. For a total of 10, a whole decade, Joseph sat in prison serving time for a crime he didn't commit. Do you ever have one of those days or seasons where it feels like everything that can go wrong does, and then somehow something else that you just couldn't have possibly expected happens too, just like the sarcastic cherry on top. Well, last week, I got a text from one of our youth leaders giving me a heads up that he might not be able to make it to middle school youth that Thursday. So it was really good of him to give our team a heads up, and he's reliable and always there unless something completely unavoidable comes up. And so last week's text, it said, hey, just a heads up, I may miss youth this week because I probably have to get a rabies shot. A bat flew into my eyeball last night. No word of a lie. A bat flew into his eyeball and he had to go for three rounds of rabies shots. My response? Of course a bat flew into your eyeball. And we both agreed it's literally the most 2020 thing we've heard. The best moments of the whole thing? The bat that one of his grade six small group boys made for him? and getting to yell at him as he left that night, good night, JM, glad you're not rabid. (laughs) What a year. Now, in good news, JM has informed me that as of this week, he's completed his full round of six shots and now can have, quote, all the bats fly into my eye that I want. (laughs) But for Joseph, having a chance that someone would put in a good word for him and then having them completely forget had to feel like that times 10. Are you kidding me? Of course this is happening. It's one of those kind of moments. And yet, even in the darkness, even forgotten in prison in a foreign city, Joseph knows that God is with him. So Joseph trusted God and waited. Two weeks ago, we were challenged to consider the question, what are you trusting God for right now? Maybe you're still wrestling with it. And this story might encourage you to keep at it, even in the waiting. Finally, two years after the baker and cupbearer situation, Pharaoh himself had some troubling dreams. And at last, Joseph is called to come before him to interpret them. Page 33, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I can't do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give the Pharaoh the answer he desires. Don't miss what's happening here. When the subject of dreams came up, Joseph, 
He focused everyone's attention on God rather than using the situation to make himself look good. Joseph has matured. Do you remember at the beginning of our story, he was a little brat telling his brothers that they were going to bow down to him and fueling their jealousy? But now he's in front of the Pharaoh doing something really impressive and giving God all the credit. He's realizing it's not actually about me. This part of Joseph's story, it had me doing some self-reflection this week too. Where in my life do I make it all about me? Where can I have blinders on and only see the ways that a situation impacts my life, my convenience, or even my ego? How about you? Where do you do that? Where do you make it all about yourself? And if you're honest, you like it that way to look good, to get the credit. Here, we're seeing growth in Joseph. He's realizing God's with me and it's not actually about me at all. My story and my life, it's all about him and he deserves all the glory. Don't let that one get away. Is this where you need to grow? Realizing it's all about God, not you. Joseph? He goes on to interpret the dreams for Pharaoh, revealing that seven years of bumper crops across Egypt were soon to come and that they would be followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh's response, we see it on page 33. Then the Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all of this known to you, there's no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be put in charge of my palace, and all of my people are to submit to your orders. I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And then the Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. And he dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Catch that? Pharaoh quickly realizes that it's God who's at work through Joseph. We've seen over and over that the Lord was with Joseph and that those around him are watching and noticing. And once more, Joseph has a new coat. And this time it's made of fine linen. How does a guy go from being a slave to the second in command in the great empire of Egypt? When we started, Joseph was 17. Now he's 30 years old. I think the last eight months have felt long. <laughs> Joseph went from favored son to slave to prisoner to being in charge of the entire land of Egypt in the course of 13 years. And he spent 10 of them in prison. And yet the entire time, God was writing his story. The Lord was with him and God's about to unfold a huge piece of the upper story in and through Joseph. But we'll have to wait for Scott to unpack that next week. John Salheimer, he points out that this is not a story of the success of Joseph. Rather, it's a story of God's faithfulness to his promises. As I look at my map of Joseph's life to this point, it's like a yo-yo. There are tons of ups and downs, peaks and valleys. And it's a reminder that the Lord was with Joseph. And he lived that out. He did the next right thing. He said no to Potiphar's wife. He lived with integrity, even in prison. He gave God credit for the dreams and people noticed. He's an example of one who always responds in total trust and obedience to the will of God. Matthew 5, 16 says this, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that, so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Not so that I look awesome and get all the credit, but so that as we live our lives with the knowledge that God is with us, we would through our words, our actions, our attitudes, point people to Jesus. That just like Potiphar and the prison warden and Pharaoh, others would recognize, hey, there's something different about you. That even in 2020, in the midst of whatever you're facing, that there's a hope, an integrity, and a steadfastness because God is with you and at work through you. Well, this week, 
in the same way that I mapped out Joseph's story, I took some time to map out mine, to look at the moments in my life where I felt like I was flourishing and the moments that felt weighty and dark. And I was reminded that the same God that we're discovering through the story, the author of creation, the God who is faithful to keep his promises to Abraham and Sarah, the one who was with Joseph, has been present and active in my life too. And my story, just like Joseph's, is all wrapped up in God's story. Is there a part of Joseph's story that you relate to? Maybe like Joseph and his brothers, you've been betrayed by some of your closest relationships. Maybe something's been said that's untrue about you, or you've been approached to make a decision or act in a way that would be so tempting, but would compromise your values and God's best for you, personally or vocationally. Or maybe things are going great and sales are up and you're looking pretty good these days, and the temptation is to take all the credit. Where do you need to be reminded that God is with you? This week, today, what's the next right thing? And who's watching? If a name or two comes to mind, write them down. Who's taking notice and thinking, because God's with you, you've got hope. Because God is with you, you're trustworthy. You're a man or a woman of character. What I love about Joseph is that no matter what coat he put on, he wore it with integrity. He trusted and was obedient to God in Potiphar's home, in prison, and as he stepped into leadership of Egypt. And my prayer is that we, like Joseph, would live lives that paint a compelling picture to others, that we would live out our core value, we light up the dark, and that our city in the rest of 2020 would seem brighter and more like the kingdom of God. That our schools, our homes, our workplaces would begin to recognize that the reason is that the Lord is with us. And so this week, as the temperatures get cooler, my hope is that when you grab your coat to head out the door, you'd simply pray, God, thank you that you're with me. Remind me that others are watching and help me to light up the dark. This week, you're going to have the opportunity to light up someone's darkness. So put your coat on and step into it knowing that God is with you and give him all the credit. And that, that would be the next right thing that you could do today. I love how every week we get this tangible next step, just like Sarah gave us, for us to take our coat and put it on and step into someone's perhaps dark moment and bring some light. <laughs> no matter who you are and what age, we can all do that this week. And hey, if you've been watching with us and you don't have a story resource, I want to encourage you, drop by our office or send us an email online. We'd love to get a book in your hands, no matter the age, so you can follow right along. And hey, if you're looking to go deeper, head to our website or app and download the Talk About It questions. Tons of information and resources for you to experience the story in a deeper way. And it features the three questions you get to talk about right now in your TCA. Thanks for being here today. I can't wait to see you back next week.